Okay, awesome. So I am so happy to be here today with Dr. Jared Siegler. Welcome, Dr. Siegler. Thank you so much for agreeing to be on the Holistic Anxiety Fix podcast. Thanks, Jody. Nice to be here. So I think I want to just dive right in and start out by um, going through what a lot of people might be confused about, which is what exactly is functional neurology and how is it different from a neurologist and how is it different from a functional medicine doctor? Yeah, of course. Um, so functional neurology is kind of the name given to what we do with neuroplasticity. That's a word people might be more familiar with. I uh, just say neuroplasticity is you can teach an old dog new tricks. We can literally rewire the brain mm -hmm. through the proper stimulation. Um, so, but then um, just touching on that real fast, there's a flip side of neuroplasticity, which we might call like a negative plasticity. Mm -hmm. Like people get better at anxiety the more they do it. People like get better at being angry the more anything the brain does it does better mm -hmm. easier the second time than the first time and the third mm -hmm. time's easier than the second so um but it's different than a neurologist because mm -hmm. that's a big question i get all the time they're like oh you're like a neurologist i'm like no like i can order mris i was like but if you need like surgery or something like that like i i don't do that like i'm not that firefighter or like you know someone might have a brain bleed so when i work with people with like a tbi or acquired brain injuries um, it's not like in that acute emergency setting, you know, mm -hmm. that's what I say. That's what the neurologist is for. Like you get in a car wreck and you might be bleeding inside your head. Like, please go to the ER, see the neurologist. I was like, but when we want to rehabilitate you, I was like, that's what I would be more prone to be like, that's what I do basically. Um, so, um, and then for functional medicine, um, cause I do functional medicine and neurology. Mm -hmm. So, um, I say one is more of the metabolic side of things. Mm -hmm. So a functional medicine doctor like, might say, oh, you might have anxiety. Let's see if you have maybe like a magnesium or a B6 deficiency. Let's maybe do you have parasites or something, you know, whatever that might be in their history or what we might think like triggered that or, hey, was it just monster right. stress? Let's maybe look at your stress response. Um, but when the functional and but when I put on my like functional neurology hat, I would just say, well, anxiety is an emotion. It's in the brain. It was like, there's nothing, the adrenals might be activated, but they're not going to drive it. We might need some things to happen. Like we might need mag magnesium or we can look at those nutritional deficiencies. But a lot of the times, especially with like an acquired brain injury, um, the brain reverts back to a reflexive state because when you boil it down um, far enough, anxiety is really just some form of inflammation on the brain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at a subcortical level so the cortex is like this big part that like, like you know when you look at like csi miami or whatever they're like oh here in the brain you know and they're looking at all those little folds and stuff i say that's the cortex but the deep mm -hmm. part like our brain stem that's what we call subcortical that's where our autonomic nervous system is so especially if um we'll just say tbi when you know we'll just say traumatic brain injury so we have kind of maybe like one type of scenario yeah. Um, so we can think of maybe anxiety. Well, A, I say, if your brain is anxious, it's not making any mistakes at all. Like that this. feeling is your brain trying to look out for you. Something's not right. Like you shouldn't be asleep. You shouldn't be meditating. Like something serious is going on. Um, cause a lot of the times we'll say in a TBI, the brain starts acting in a reflexive state. Say we bam, just hit our forehead real bad. So this starts to go down the, the frontal cortex. So if you know anyone that's hit their head hard enough, I don't remember stuff. Maybe they're not good at math. Maybe their personality changes, but we can see like, wow, something's different. And we yeah. usually see a lot of anxiety behind it because the brain then starts to operate typically in a reflexive state. So this is where we might start to look at what we call primitive reflexes. Mm. Um, I like see them the all man. the time. Well, no, but no. more like uh, more like developmental milestones for a baby. Oh, uh, once we start looking at is, is the brain operating in a reflexive state, I just say it's kind of like arm wrestling. You know, if we have the front of the cortex is trying to stay calm and focus on work and, you know, do my school or whatever that person has to do that hit their head. The reflexive part of their brain is like, this does not matter right now. I don't care if you remember. I don't care if you're nice. I don't care if you relax. Like, this is not important. Um, so then I say we have to kind of really look at that. 
and not just say, well, here's, and that's where, as you know, there's a difference between functional medicine and green medicine. Oh, you have anxiety. Let's get to the cause of it. Oh, you have anxiety. Take this supplement. Like, oh, yeah. here's your anxiety supplement. It's like, I don't know if that's necessarily functional medicine. It might yeah. work, you know? And I find that there's a lot of people in my world that come to me and they think that's what healing is. They've kind of just replaced this model of like, you know, oh, I I have a a magic pill that I take to like, oh, I have a magic supplement. Like what is the magic supplement? Oh, L-theanine didn't work. Natural healing doesn't work for me. Um, And there's this like really, and I think this comes from how conventional medicine teaches healing, this lack of understanding that it's actually something deeper going on. And I loved, and I just kind of wanted to highlight this again, that you said, like, if you have anxiety, it's not because your brain is doing something wrong because, you know, so many, I, t- I speak to hundreds of women and they're all on all, all, but like most of them told the same thing, which is like, oh, like your body is off. It's just anxiety. We can't find anything in your blood work. It's just anxiety. It's just your mindset. You just need to like calm down and relax and take medication. And so it's been like pounded into women that, you know, their anxiety is their fault. And Mm -hmm. then there's this like self-hatred that comes or the shame that comes of like, what's wrong with me that I can't control my anxiety or like my brain is just randomly broken. And so I love that you said like, no, your body is actually like doing this for you. Oh yeah. It's totally looking out. Um, like I deal with a lot of women, um, that have had like trauma, basically like assaults. Um, Mm -hmm. and I remember when I worked in person, like I've been virtual for over five years now, but this, she was the victim of sexual crime. And I could tell just me being in the same room with her, she was like shrinking back in the chair. And I'm just Mm -hmm. like, Hey, you want me to like open the door? Like we can go someplace more open. And she's like, sorry. She's like, I'm sorry. I'm nervous. And I'm like, there's no need to be sorry. I'm like, last time you were alone with a guy, look what happened to you. I was like, your brain is just like, Oh God, not again. You know? Yeah. Um, Cause it looks for that. And not to sound um, like I'm from the country. Um, so if we ever like run across a dog, the easiest way to see if it's been beat is raise your fist. Oh, really? If it hunches back, that knows what that fist means, right? Mm-hmm. So then it would say that dog didn't make a mistake being anxious and nervous when it saw that fist go in there. Right. I thought it was about to get hit. It's like, oh gosh, not again. It's like, so our brain has a feed forward mechanism. Our hippocampus, our memory center starts to remember these things. Mm-hmm. What was this like body tone inflection? Like a lot of trauma for our child, childhood trauma. I mean, oh, a ton yes. of people yes. have childhood trauma. They are, kids are not resilient. Uh, that's why there's so many adults in therapy, but <laughs> that that's a common, oh, kids are resilient. No, no they're not. They, they're just, they're, they, they haven't reached that breaking point yet. Things mm-hmm. might've changed for them, but they don't know how to, oh, I'm anxious or I'm this, I say they're just hyperactive or something like that, or they act out. Um, Cause then there's all these impulses that start to come out. And again, the frontal cortex is down. So then we can't kind of corral those impulses. Now we have people saying things, doing things. They're just that impulsiveness because um, it's called the amygdala steel. Cause so the amygdala is a part of the brain that's responsible for anxiety, anger, fear, like what I might call survival emotions. They're not like bad, um, but they keep you alive. Um, Important, so but nobody wants to be stuck in the amygdala emotions for no. like, a lifetime. <laughs> No. And you know, the back of the brain is stronger than the front. And that's where when I work with a lot of women, they say, I've tried meditating, I've tried this, I've tried journaling. And I'm like, that's because you're trying to do a conscious thought to get rid of a reflex. Yes. I was like, because if I hit your knee with that hammer, the reflex hammer, you know, like a neurologist would what's called a DTR, we hit them and their leg kicks. I say, even if you're sitting there, because everybody does it, they're like, don't kick. Sure enough, you kick every (laughs) time, right? So I say, so we know that your conscious thought can't overpower a reflex. It's just the way it is. Right. Um, So then I say, instead of thinking of overpowering that reflex, the way that we would get someone's knee to quit kicking is we would just keep hitting the knee with the hammer. Eventually that nervous system is going to fatigue. And then they're like, hey, my leg quit kicking. Did you break Mm -hmm. it? We're like, no, but we've fatigued that reflex. So back to a lot of the times I'll see people, they have these primitive reflexes for developmental milestones. If they get their hit 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 hard enough and they're in the hospital, you can 
it's mean to do, but you can play games with them. If they're like in a coma, you put something in their hand, they just grab it like a baby did. You stroke their cheek, they'll start to turn their head just like a baby used to, you know, looking for something. To, so those are the reflexive parts of the brain. Um, and those are the more survival. I need to eat. I can't decide what to poop. I can't talk. I can't do so. It's depending on someone's like, we'll just say again, TBI. Like again, if someone hits their head hard enough, we might see things go really south. Not just, oh, I forgot a few things, but they forget like basic functions. Like now they're dribbling in their diaper, not diaper, but <laughs> sorry, I work with a lot of autistic kids and I say kids, a 32 year old autistic patient. So these kids grow up, right? Um, but anyways, so I'm just used to like, oh, diapers and stuff. But um, these are where we see a lot of changes in autonomic function. My mm-hmm. heart is blah, 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 blah. like, right. oh, but I did the heart monitor. I went to the cardiologist there. My heart's fine. We're like, thank God. Um, but then we're like, but your brain can't control those organs because your autonomic nervous system is back here. That's heart. That's like heart, blood flow, like all these things that we just can't consciously control. Consciously. So I guess my question is, if I'm to channel people listening to this is like, what would cause outside of like me having a very obvious car accident with an obvious head injury? um, What other things would cause like a traumatic brain injury or an acquired brain injury or something where the autonomic nervous system is like, is stuck in in the uh, the amygdala steel state like what would yeah. cause that from happening to happen sometimes it can be trauma emotional stress mm-hmm. um that's big especially if someone's kids involved like wow uh the stress response is just on steroids uh any every mammal <laughs> ever shown to do that is like really crazy about when their kids get involved right like mama bear type thing right sometimes there's this kind of breaking point Sometimes it can be a head injury. Sometimes it can be like emotional stress, physical stress. Um, Sometimes we'll see what I call the little critters. Like I see mold do it a lot. Mm. Parasites too. Oh my gosh. Um, I just say, uh, especially when we look at like gut infections, because back to anxiety is going to be inflammation on a subcortical level. Let's say, say we have a leaky gut. That's like I broke into your home, right? I Mm -hmm. say, think of that analogy. There's destruction, there's inflammation, right? Broken window, door frames split off the hinges, whatever. Um, But it's a very stressful situation. I used to grow up in a not too great part of town. So I know what it's like to hear somebody trying to break into your home. You're definitely like, (laughs) like you wouldn't just be sitting here continuing the podcast if someone tries to start barreling through the door. So so I say, if we have this 24 seven kind of, source of stress that's not i gotta wake up for monday for the job the kids have to be here i gotta pay this bill like this is something that just gets poured into our stress bucket 24 7 okay way because especially when we think of putting the brain in that reflexive state um, a lot of things kind of act like a head injury even though physically somebody didn't get their head hit so that's where parasites hack into the system hard Uh, I just say they can talk to our nervous system. They can talk to our immune system, which is why they can cause such a huge problem with people in their immune system, like allergies, asthma, autoimmunity. By the flip token, and I know this is off base, I see people with like women with lupus who I've, we did the workup, we did everything. And they're like, what do we do? And I'm like, you could benefit from actually taking some parasites. Like it's real good research that not all parasites are bad. So we know they can hack into the system so much they can trigger autoimmunity, but they can shut off stuff like lupus too, where these moms are like, I can play with my kid. I have energy. I haven't been on steroids in over a year. We're like, yeah, keep your kidneys, you know, thank God. Um, But so that's where I say there can be this kind of stress bucket because stress is inflammation and inflammation is stress. If you've ever yelled at your kids, you know exactly what I'm talking about. We turn red, we get hot. Those are some of those traditional signs of inflammation we learned Mm. in school called rubor, calor, dolor, like things get hot, they get red, like, you know, and we're like, hey, yeah, that looks like inflammation, but nobody got a bacterial infection, but we still see inflammation with something like a angry encounter or something like that. Right, which you wouldn't necessarily think about. So I'm glad you brought that up. And I know for me, um, and I know we talked about this as is mold causing that acquired brain injury, which, you know, I never really thought about until 
uh, you know, I started realizing how the mold was impacting my way of thinking. Um, and then I think you and I were talking and you said, well, that's actually an acquired brain injury. Uh, and there was something really validating about hearing that, you know, hearing that it's not just like your brain just didn't decide to stop working one day. Yeah, you know, There's a reason, like for me, a lot of it, I heard, oh, you're just getting older. And I think it's really important to distinguish, like if you're physically not feeling well, the disintegration of the mind and increased anxiety is not normal. It's a message from the body that something is going on. Yeah. And it's really too, when we think of like, well, what shuts down the front of the brain? So back to those primitive reflexes, um, the front of the brain should get stronger than the reflexes. Right. So now a child can choose when to eat. They can choose how to hold a pen and move their fingers. They can decide I'm going to poop here. I'm going to pee here. They don't just, doesn't just happen. Right. Right. Um, yeah. Yay. Right. Um, but then we think, um, because then we sometimes think, well, what's kind of keeping their frontal cortex off? Is it emotional stress? Is it some form of gut inflammation? Is it blood sugars? Oh my gosh. Like if pe people can't even skip a meal. Like if you start, like people go longer than two hours without eating, they turn into a jerk. Right. And I'm like, that look, was me. Look, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, look at how delicate your brain function is. Mm. You can't even miss a meal. You can't handle that stress. What makes us think we can handle all these other stresses like detoxifying, doing all the things that all the blogs tell us to do. Oh, I got to kill these parasites. Oh, I got to get rid of this toxin. I got to do that. And I say, that's a big process to demand, of, especially of someone's brain to do. Um, detoxifying the liver is easy, right? Celery juice or something, just, you know, fast. Like there's a billion shakes out there to detox your liver. Detoxifying your brain is very hard, mm. especially with how something like mold works. Because um, I coach doctors how to do this. And I say, it's way different than metals. Metals are just inert. They kind of maybe attach and make a thing called a haptin molecule with like a neuron or something, but they just sit there. They're like, not mold. It's alive. It fights to survive. It mm. runs, it hides, it changes how the immune system works. It can burrow its way into the brain and other places too. Um, it works very well at doing that. And the way it operates, when we see how it activates the immune system, how it causes excitation in the brain in a bad way, like how whenever, um, well, people know what that excitation is like, especially after they hit their head. Oh, these lights are so bright. I can't handle noise. Like, I just can't handle this stuff right now. My neurons are just going. And that gets real bad because if a neuron goes too much, it starts to, it's gone. It and then- yeah, it's called neuroexcitotoxic model of death. Mold is whoa. extremely excitatory whoa. to neurons. Go ahead. No, I was just like, whoa. Yeah. So <laughs> that's know. where like, when so when I'm saying like my brain is exploding, it's like probably accurate. Yeah, that's why they say, you know, like, oh, uh, aspartame eats holes in your brain. Like people will hear that and they say, it, and that's true. Because so what happens, we have a thing called glutamate. That's like it's a neurotransmitter. But by volume, it's 95% of all of our neurotransmitters. And you need it with dopamine and serotonin. And you need it to kind of start firing. It has to be present um, or it doesn't work. So, but then, so then when these neurons start to explode, all that glutamate starts to activate the neuron next to it. Now that one's really excited and firing and firing. So that's where with functional neurology, what we find is we have to sometimes stimulate, not annihilate. Um, I've seen people start to feel dizzy from vagus nerve stimulation. Really? They're like, oh, I feel dizzy when I do that thing with my ear. What are you doing, doc? I'm like, that's called blood flow to your brain. Like you didn't have it before. So now that we've increased blood flow to your brain, you're just kind of like this lightheaded, like, and sometimes that's step number one, especially when we think of anxiety and stress being activated. Blood flow is shut off here. Back to the hangry analogy, right? Blood flow doesn't go up here when we're hangry. That's why right. we're not nice to our coworkers. That's why we're just like, I got to eat and I got to eat something either like super sugary or super fat. Like I need a ton of calories right now because that right. survival mechanism starts to kick in. Um, so for a lot of my patients, because we know the benefits of like, say after a head injury, um, if we were to talk, well, again, I don't, I'm not the neurologist, like, you know, but I'll say, well, on the way to the emergency room, don't eat anything. 
I would actually stop eating. Don't let them give you a Snickers bar after you get out of the MRI. Sugar is the worst thing you can do. Mm. from an Because we know fasting is so beneficial for a lot of things, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but that's where when we think of a head injury, we have to get rid of the old and dead and dying neurons or we can't build anything to take its place. I think oh. of it like renovating a kitchen. You got to take out the old cabinets before you can put in the new ones. So if people aren't, if their immune system can't clear after a head injury, they eat high sugar diets, they're doing all these things, then they stop the, um, or they take all these anti-inflammatories. I know it seems counterintuitive, but people are like, oh, I just really hit my head hard. Should I take some turmeric? I'm like, absolutely not. Mm. Like you should not try to shut off inflammation. I know it's not fun, but you shouldn't try to shut off inflammation for probably about three days. Interesting people can fast I say don't eat that's what I would do if I hit my head real hard I would just quit eating and I wouldn't eat for three days and I would sleep once I'm cleared for a bleed don't keep waking somebody up every two hours that's ridiculous like the 1980s called they want their research back because sleeping is when you start to clear the glymphatics and you start to get all that stuff out of your brain all the dead and dying stuff because that has to go by the wayside so with a lot of anxiety We metabolically look at the trigger, you know, we just sometimes see what's going on. I don't like to kick at the hornet's nest. Um, I was just consulting with a girl earlier this morning and she's, I was just like, when did your anxiety start? She's like, after my guard is still shot. And I was like, okay, because there's actually autoimmune anxiety. There's a small population. So, and I see that because when you're like, show me anxiety on blood tests, I say, well, we can't, but I can show you how the nervous system gets attacked by the immune system causing excitation. Yes. And now we might start to see some wind up going on. And it's very yeah. easy to see if you know what to look for. I see a, a small portion of women in the programs that I work with, with autoimmune and anxiety. When you start to decrease inflammation and address the autoimmune triggers their anxiety, like it's like night and day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's where when we think of functional neurology, like I do a lot of the, I just tell people I'm not a therapist, but Mm -hmm. what I find is um, there's a lot of what we would call perseveration in the neuro world, which means it just, I think the same thought over and over and over. Like the OCD without the compulsions. Basically. Yeah. So the thought, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So we see a lot of that, especially back to the primitive reflexes with kids. We usually see, like I work with a lot of autistic kids and they're like, oh yeah, he lines the trucks up every time. Or if we don't do it the right way, there's that rigidity, right? Where now Mm -hmm. they explode. Um, Sometimes adults are like that too. You know, they might not be autistic, but then we'll see kind of these very, maybe hemispherific, hemispherific, one side versus the other, one hemisphere versus the next, hemisphericity. Anyways, um, you know, but like the left brain is let's do the same thing over and over again. And the right brain is like, well, let's do something new and different. Mm. So sometimes we'll start to think of it as, well, what if we just start activating that cortex or whichever side went down, um, like whichever side they hit, did they hit the right side? Did they hit the left side? Like, what are we, you know, where are we going after? Um, so then we just know how to stimulate it and stimulating it seems for a lot of people weird. I've had a lot of women tell me stuff like, so putting an electric toothbrush on my tongue, holding an ice pack on the oh, side nice. of my face while I stare at my husband's thumb in front of me while he spins me in the chair, like that's going to help my anxiety. And I'm like, absolutely it will. <laughs> <laughs> I think if you told me that without knowing you, I'd be like, um, okay, yeah. what are we doing well, here? Exactly. And that's where, cause a lot of people don't know how the brain works. Mm-hmm. So, cause when we think of back to these primitive reflexes, like most people, when they go to the neurologist, I say to the do what's called a cranial nerve exam. And they're like, what? And I'm like, did they look at your eyes move? Did you stick out your tongue? Did they look in the back of your throat? Like, did they actually see how these nerves are working? Um, cause we don't feel our face with our cortex. Mm. We actually feel our face with our brain stem. Oh, that's so where we're back to stroking. If we mm. see them and they're like, Hey, we're just going to elicit a reflex. I feel something. Let me get some food. Like, let me find it. I feel something. Let me grab it. Right. And they don't even know what it is. So then the reflexes start to take over. So that's where we have to start. And when we think of that autonomic nervous system, where do people think it is? It's in the brainstem. We can't control it with our thoughts. No. (laughs) And this is why therapy doesn't work for 
um, yeah, people it can. on this level. And that's level. where I would say it can, yeah. But honestly, um, and not, I'm not against any therapy whatsoever because I have patients that have anxiety. They're like, I love my therapist. I'm like, well, go see her still. That's great because you still angle. have to have this. Yeah, you still have to have this cortical activation. We can talk about it. So there are scenarios where I would say that thing works. Um, I just it's find necessarily you have to have more tools in your toolbox, though. So, so explain to me then, let's go at this for a second. What is electric toothbrush spinning in circles while staring at a thumb with an ice pack on my face? What, what, what is that actually doing? Yeah. How, how is it, if we're just yeah. dissect like one strategy, how is it actually yeah. going to help with so my the tongue in the face, anxiety? Yeah. The tongue in the face activate what's called the pons. That's a lot of the, the parasympathetic nervous mm. system, feeling our face, feeling our tongue, um, that's why the vagus nerve will usually have people put stuff on their throat to throat or their ear to activate the vagus nerve. That's why a lot of like chanting and a lot of religions have these types of things. Oh, mm -hmm. um, you know, cause we see that vibration. Um, so that's a different story, but so we'll start activating part of that parasympathetic nervous system and start activating their brain stem. Um, and by that turn, we can start activating one part of their brain versus the other, but then we have what's called a vestibulosympathetic reflex. So the number one symptom of somebody having a vestibular issue, ear canals, right? Where we think of Meniere's like, oh, I'm dizzy. That I get motion sickness. Like that's, that's number two. Number one is anxiety caused by loud crowded places. If people are like, I can't go in Costco. It's too busy. It's too crowded. I get anxious. So we're like, that's a vestibular that's issue. Like your ear canals can't mm -hmm. suppress your sympathetic nervous system. Wow. So then you start to get a little sweaty. Your heart starts beating. Your sympathetic nervous system that in turn starts to activate your amygdala, your anxiety center of the brain. And now I got to get out of here. And they just bolt. And they're like, I can't be in the store right now. I had to leave. Or mm -hmm. it just got too debilitating for them. So a lot of the times we'll start to try to strengthen the ear canals by what's called gaze stabilization, where someone moves their head, but they look at a target. Um, and then we start breaking things down a little bit more. You know, is it one side versus the next? Does somebody actually need it? So there's always going to be an exam. Again, back to like the supplements. Not like, oh, here's your anxiety supplement. It's not like, here's your anxiety stimulation. Or like, right. unfortunately, that's not how it works. So you can't um, just go listen to this and put an ice pack on your face and spin yourself in circles. It's not going to do. No. Same well, thing. and that's where we want to stimulate, not annihilate. Because if we start spinning someone too much, they might say things like, I'm feeling sweaty. That's when we know we're getting too much stimulation on them. So we're like, hey, just chill out. Because we might say, hey, uh, you know, slow spin to the right 15 times, you know, have your husband do it in a chair. We're going to start activating your cerebellum a little bit more than if you spin yourself. Again, there's little nuances that we might do, like maybe the dot might be up here. It might not be in the middle or it might be over here, depending on kind of what your canals and stuff. Um, but anyways, so um, but then we start trying to get to the point where people can stimulate more and more and more. And the changes are usually more gradual than kind of how they happened. Like with a head injury, it's like, bam, right? Like my anxiety was overnight. I woke up with yeah. it type deal. Like woke up out of the car wreck. I was like, I feel really nervous. And we're like, yep, probably never went away sometimes. Um, but the changes that we see are typically like, um, like I had one woman, she couldn't even, she was in a real bad car wreck. She would have to lay in the back seat with her eyes closed while her husband would drive to church or anywhere. She couldn't like, if she would just start to see the road, she'd be like, oh gosh, like I'm just going to have a fit. Mm. And she's already on like Lexapro. I mean, she's on like some anti-anxiety meds basically. Um, go through the thought like, hey, you know, your brain's not making a mistake. Anyways, I remember she sent me <laughs> this text message uh, I have a text message thing on my patient on my patient portal. And she's like, I was able to drive to the store and she lived like a little round gas station, but she's like, I was able to drive to the store today. And that was big, you know, for her, but I say it's, um, but usually when we look at these changes, we'll see kind of gradual things. Like when yeah. I work with parents of autistic kids, I say, they're not just gonna like be able to spit out poetry overnight. Right. I was like, but, you know, we'll hear that like mama or dada or kak or pa or, where or whatever. They're like, hey, they made a new noise. Hey, they did like, this is new. This is different. We noticed this is a little change a little bit more. 
Um, like I'll usually have, uh, especially people with anxiety with a lot of heart issues, will start doing what's called a pulse oximeter on their finger. And that measures their heart rate, measures their blood pressure and O2 saturation. So we can get a lot of information on how their nervous system is talking to their heart. And then we might start doing things like, hey, let's stimulate the left cheek. Like, so let's go after your left pons. Whoa, whoa, my heart rate slowed down. Ah, oh, yeah. I spun. Whoa, I spun too fast. Now my heart rate is bump, 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 mm -hmm. bump. Um, so then we can really start to get some feedback, like real time with like, how is your nervous system working? How are we shutting off certain oh, things? Sure. How are we activating certain parts too? So like activating the pawns then is like calming your system down. And by continually activating it, it's like a muscle. So you're kind of like strengthening that muscle, mm -hmm. so to speak, so that it's able to come on its own so that, you know, five years from now, you're not just like walking around with your hand on your face. Yeah. Like kind of like almost like a reawoken back that part of the sleepy part of the nervous system that was dormant. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Back yeah. yeah. Um, I usually have people do things about maybe three or four times a day. It's like riding a bike. I say, you know, your brain had to learn how to do it. The more you tried to learn how to ride a bike, the faster your brain got it. If you tried like once a month for five minutes, probably took a while, you know? Right. Um, you know, so how, cause I find to make these changes in the brain and you got to hit it hard sometimes, not like in a bad way, but we have to create enough stimulation and so that's why we'll start doing more than one thing at once. Um, cause uh, I, like the spinning and the ice pack and the, and the thumb. Yeah. So I think of it like a bench press. Um, you know, the guys are always wanting to add more plates to their bench press, make it stronger, make it harder say, well, cause nobody wants to bench press forever. Right. Most guys would rather bench press 300 pounds once than like, you know, 50 pounds, six times, you know, yeah. then they're like, who cares? Um, so I say the way we stack the plates on your brain is we start to do more than one thing at a time. It's what's called the Hebean process. So when we start to do that, we raise it base 10. So if I do two things for the pawns, it's not 10 times or it's 10 times more effective, not twice as effective. If we start doing three things for the pawns. Now it's a hundred times more effective. We start doing four things. Now we're at a thousand. So it raises very rapidly. So that's where um, I have some patients that have like neuro rehab clinics in their basement, basically. They're like, I have this laser, I have this vibration device, I have this, I have this, you know, um, transcutaneous nerve stimulator or whatever. They're like, I have all these equipments. So we're like, cool, let's do them all at the same time. Mm. Um, and, you know, and then I just tell people it varies, right? Like, again, back to how much is it going to take for their not maybe nonverbal autistic kid to talk? I say some kids get it quick. I've seen some kids start to say words after literally the first five minutes of therapy. Wow. And that's one of those, like, I'll take it. Like, I, I, I even told the mom, like, I didn't expect it to be that fast. Like, he was really <laughs> wanting to talk. Um, so, yay, that was easy. But I tell a lot of parents, like, I don't know how much it's going to take. But if we start to see little changes with maybe 10 minutes, three times a day to 20 minutes, three times a day, does that have us do it faster? So then we start to notice more because um, it's like working out, right? Mm. I mean, it truly is. I use that analogy. I just say, do you think anyone that's like on the cover of a bodybuilding or sports illustrated magazine cover, do you think they got the body they wanted with one trip to the gym? Of course they did. I know, right? Like it's January 2nd. Where is my like 18 inch biceps? Like where'd they go? Uh, so I say, no. Um, so I always tell people with the brain, especially because um, a bodybuilder said it, and I think he, he was right about it. He said, success isn't measured in inches and pounds. It's measured in millimeters and ounces. Mm. It's that consistency over time that we find. Um, Cause like back to people with autoimmune anxiety, say we get them good. And I'm like, I can never guarantee that you're not going to like walk into a moldy hotel room again though. Like, so what happens when that autoimmunity flares up? Well, now we know how your nervous system responds. We know how your immune system responds. And so I tell a lot of people like, here's your emergency inhaler from like a functional medicine, functional neurology standpoint, like for mm -hmm. your anxiety, you know, um, or say there's another big stress like, oh, I got to call the kids were in a wreck, you know, like life happens. Right. And I've learned, um, cause when we think of, especially a TBI, a head injury, I just tell people that the immune system will never be the same in that part of the brain again. 
right. no matter how much turmeric or hopes and prayers or whatever people take, like it's just the way it is. We can't change that. Uh, I, I say it's like boiling an egg. Once it's boiled, you can't unboil it. So that's where we. Um, how really does that relate with neuroplasticity then? Because neuroplasticity says that you can connect it. And now you're saying you boil an egg. Oh, yeah. Well, no, I'm talking egg. about the immune cells now. Oh. So we have so we have support neurons. So we have a synapse where one neuron sends its signal to the next and they kind of a goosh. Yeah. We have a microglial cell, which is the immune cells in the brain. Oh. Those are the ones that uh, they do a lot. Um, so I say they're kind of just observing, making sure everyone's playing by the rules, but then they have the astrocytes, which are the support cells. And those basically, I say, those are like the referees. Mm. Their, their feet make up the blood brain barrier. So they stack their hands and feet in a big wall and start making the blood brain barrier, all these things. So, but all that to say, um, when we have a bad enough head injury, the immune cells become what's called polarized, meaning now they can't just use a firecracker of inflammation. They only know how to use a stick of dynamite, even for when a, even when for when a firecracker would be appropriate. They don't know how. So you they're can't reset the gauge. Not for the immune system. Nobody mm -hmm. knows how to do it right now. So that's where I tell people yes. with head injuries, like, "Hey, you're feeling good, but don't hit your head again." Like, doesn't right. work that way, you know. Like, if you hit it again. Bad news bear. I mean, look at that Tua guy, that the um, quarterback guy. He, I don't watch sports, but I heard about this guy. So he was a quarterback. He had a mild concussion on Sunday. They cleared him to play. Mild concussion again on Thursday. He had what's called decorticate posturing and decerebrate posturing on his hands, meaning he was hit so hard. He didn't lose consciousness either, but it was the fact he got hit so close together that his immune cells were still primed. Uh, we call it the double crush uh, or the double tap, like, because that's where like, because um, I do work with athletes and they're like, hey, his 40 time is good. Like we need him on Sunday. I'm like, I don't care. Like if he hits his head again on Sunday, like it doesn't matter how much padding you have, like his brain will just unravel all over again. Like, mm. cause we have a certain time period, like 60 days is usually like the window, like nothing within two months of a head injury. That's why some kids get super mad at docs like me when we're like, you're out for the season. Like your concussion right. was that bad. It doesn't matter if you can still throw the ball and hit the ball. Like you can't afford to get your head hit again. And I tell a lot of these parents, like, no offense, your kid's probably not going to go pro. Right. You know, like, is it worth it? You know, because they're probably no offense going to end up being an accountant or working in an office or something like that. Like the odds of a child going pro is like you probably win the lottery before that'll happen. Right. And so like if you're talking about repeated assaulting. So in this case, you're talking about like massive head injury. But what if it was like, um, like chronic mold or you've had parasites ongoing is that considered like another event and another event or like does it have that kind of consecutive build or is the abi or like the t traumatic part of the brain injury in a different category than like activating the yeah, microglial cells from like biology it's actually a good question i haven't seen it from parasites and mold i would say it's more of a lump sum continual like it just gets worse and worse and worse i have seen it with heavy metals and i don't want to get you censored but when we look at say a child born on day one two heavy metal two shots with heavy metals mm -hmm. two months four shots with heavy metals mm -hmm. four months they get five shots with heavy metals. Six months, they get six shots with heavy metals. See where I'm going with this? Yeah. Every 60 days, we're just bukoof, bukoof, bukoof. And when you look at what aluminum does to the microglial cells in the brain, it's bad. It's super mm. excitatory. The immune system gets so excited from aluminum. That's why they add it to the shots. Because if you just put a dead virus in there, the immune system is going to be like, cool story, bro. Nobody cares. Oh, then, when you sprinkle, then when you we want that excitatory for the yeah for, for the immune the response immune yeah response and then they're like look we made all these antibodies to this measles or this mumps or you know uh hepatitis for one day old like because you know that or kid is box. yeah exactly so we see these types of things but and that's where um i know this is taking a hard left but that's where a lot of parents tell me things like, well, the six month shots, 
he was a little different, but after eight months, like it was over. He lost eye contact. He lost, he, he quit. He was starting to stand up. He lost that. Like he's back to crawling again, kind of his right leg doesn't move like the left one anymore. And I'm saying that was that like their immune system is just finally getting so mad. It's like, I can't handle this anymore. Right. So then if we um, talk about like, so I know I don't want to get your podcast censored or anything, but I mean, um, so I would just be like, like oh, okay. oh, go ahead. If we talk about chronic illness, then in, mm -hmm. in like adults, right. Yeah. We probably have a history. Most people I think do have this history of the shock and then you're adding in like maybe some parasites and maybe some mold and maybe some stress and I feel like everyone these days it's like the norm to be like go 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 and so yeah. like you add all of those things in and so in a sense like I don't want to generalize here but I would say that most women would have like some low level of microglial activation as their almost baseline is this like yeah. am I over dramatizing no. this no. no, um, the easiest way to see it, um, I don't want to get, I don't want to throw stones in a glass house, um, definitely changes, uh, in mood and stuff with hormone changes. Progesterone is very protective of the nervous system. So I can't tell somebody, but on the way to the ER after a massive head injury, take that progesterone and just rub <laughs> it all over your body. Not, it doesn't shut off inflammation, but wow, it's so neuroprotective. Like so neuropathy, yeah. Oh. So but if then, I'm working with women who are low in progesterone, then they're they so irritable and anxious have... around the second half of my cycle. Yeah. Then they're like, ah, we can see hormonal influences on nervous system function. So there could be some hormonal imbalance that's really driving that. But then we also, you know, I put on my functional neurology hat and I think, why is the brain changing so much function? You know, and that's different than maybe, well, I get bloated and my breasts get tender or something. Then I'm like, okay, those are hormone changes. But when someone's like, I get anxious, I get forgetful, I get so foggy. I'm like, the foggy headed, especially like brain fog is the immune system being activated in the brain. Hmm. So when people are like, I'm foggy, I'm da, da, da. Um, and it, that can happen after like sleep, lack of sleep. Right. If you don't want to heal your brain, just try to not sleep effectively or for, you know, a good solid eight hours, um, everything starts to shut down. Like it doesn't matter how tough or, you know, um, oh, I can cold bath this. I can go this long without fasting. <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter. I'll say you try to go without sleep. It's over and your yeah. brain can't recover from that. Right. Right. So somebody with low progesterone, that's really impacting their brain. You're saying there's probably something else going on under the surface. In addition yeah. to the low progesterone, that's yeah. making that shift so grand. We call it the triangulation theory. So mm -hmm. I hit my head right here. This part kind of goes down compared to everything else. Maybe I'm just not as good as I was, but now I haven't slept. I ate sugary food. Mm -hmm. Mom died. Like, so everything goes down, but this is already down. So then we start to see go down even faster. So a lot of the times we'll start fatiguing the nervous system when we start looking at it, mm -hmm. um, meaning the exam changes. So a lot of times, like, for example, my anxiety gets so much worse when I lay down. We're like, that's your cerebellum. Your cerebellum's off. It can't get those controls anymore. It's getting too many signals coming up. Um, so then we're like, ah, interesting. Hmm. So now maybe we should do your neuro exam. And, um, cause I work online. So I'm like, okay, now I'm going to look at your cranial nerves with you laying down. Now I'll stick your tongue out. Now we're going to see how your eyes move. Now we're going to check all these primitive reflexes out. So sometimes we'll see just a positional change in gravity be a huge thing. Interesting. Cause I do hear a lot of women saying that they're anxious when they lie down. And mm. so that's, that's sort of what's going on there which is fast. yeah because the cerebellum works on gravity so you know then if we lay down our cerebellum's like oh i don't have to worry about us falling over cool done i'm off like i'm gonna take a break i'll still do some other stuff but you know you don't really need me right now mm -hmm. um you know so and those might be especially women too that uh, they don't feel good in wide open spaces they're like, oh, I get out in the field. Like, give me, they're, they're kind of the opposite of what we might expect. Like, give me buildings around me. Keep me in a room. I get out in the field and I'm just like, oh my gosh. Um, so funny how things can change when you know what to look for. Well, that's just it, right? As I think like this has been so enlightening to just 
um, hear about all of the small, small symptoms that you would just kind of link as like, oh, it's just anxiety. And you sort of pieced apart or pulled apart even just a few of them and been like, oh, like this is this part of the brain. And like this symptom is often associated with dysfunction in this part of the brain. Um, And I mean, my heart is like, I wish that this was part of conventional healing where, you know, part of, maybe I'm a daydreamer here, but like part of the assessment instead of, you know, the conventional practitioners trying to convince people that, you know, they're they're it's all in their mind the yeah. mind and the brain are different. And I think that's what we're really pulling apart here. It's sort of, it is in your head, but not in the way that you would think. Um, yeah. that it's in no, your- it really, that's where I tell people like, oh, they're anxious. I've been told it's in my head. I'm like, not to sound mean, that neurologist is hundred percent right. Your anxiety is in your head, but how to fix it might not be in your head. It's not like you're doing this to yourself or something. Um, So when when would somebody know to like come to you or another functional neurologist? Like if, if they have it because, you know, because they work with anxious women, I feel like everyone's going to be like, oh my gosh, I need to go see him. So how, how do we pull apart? Like I need to see a functional neurologist. I need to see a functional medicine practitioner. I need to see a therapist. Yeah. Kind of to answer your question. Like I feel this should be the standard of care. Mm-hmm. Like when people are like, how come my neurologist doesn't do this? Or how come my physical therapist or occupational therapist or, you know, depending on what's going on, I'm just like, I don't know. I'm like, you have to ask them. Like, um, I didn't even like to do a lot of the brain stuff. And so I was going to work with athletes when I went to Cairo school. It mm-hmm. took me. Uh, I've had over like 600 hours in functional neurology, so I could have had a diplomate twice. <laughs> So I just don't care because it's not good. But to me, that's where I say, when should be, I say, I think we should be like right out of the gate. Like after you get cleared from the ER, like, cool, mm-hmm. you don't have, say you got a head injury, like, cool, you're not bleeding internally. You're not like at risk of, you know, stroking out or something in the next 48 hours. Like, whew, all right, now let's rehab. Right. Like, um, And what about the women without an obvious traumatic brain injury? Like, would you be a good fit for them or not? Yeah, we got to dig. A lot of the times women tell me like, it's so random. I'm like, but it's not, it's Mm -hmm. random because we haven't found what's going on yet. So it seems random. Um, And back to the dizziness, like if we see someone hit their head so hard, they might know they have what's called a Meniere's or like the rocks in their ear canals are loose because they'll say things like, oh yeah, I look down into the right every time. We're like, okay, so we know what canal that is. We might have to do some rock maneuvers, like repositioning maneuvers and get them around. Um, But that's where sometimes it is hard to see the forest because of the trees. So a lot of the times when we start, when I start working with women, we're like, okay, I'm feeling really good. Oh, but then I started to go through the hormonal changes. So we're like, okay, now let's dive through that a little bit more. Mm -hmm. What makes it better? What makes it worse? Like now that we know what good feels like, we can identify not good a little bit easier sometimes. Right. You know, it's kind of like the people that are like, I'm always bloated. (laughs) They're like, I don't know what food causes it. Then we're like, okay. So then when we fix that, then now we can start to identify, oh yeah, eat bananas. They blow me out. We're like, okay, quit eating bananas and don't overthink (laughs) it. You know, like just don't overthink it. That's what I tell a lot of people. Um, Because back to a a toothbrush, a cold pack, a spinny chair, like um, knowing what to do can be complex, but I found with functional neurology, usually what we do is not complex. It's pretty low key. Now that's where I would say there is a varying degree. Like sometimes when I work with people and say, I'm talking to the husband of a wife that had traumatic brain injury, cause she can't speak anymore. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay, your head injury is so severe. Like you probably need to go in person with somebody that has all the lasers and the doodads and the gizmos that cost like a quarter million dollars because that's what it's going to take like we need more than a spinny chair at that scenario and that's why i really vet people like i have these discovery calls basically i see like can i help you are you going to be able to do what it takes and do we like each other really at the end of the day um because you know i i don't have on a white coat with a stethoscope so if people are looking for that and they're a little irritable that they're in a three-piece suit and I'm not that I'm like oh, maybe we won't be a good fit you know like I try to keep <laughs> calm here in this office like I've had my head injuries too you mm-hmm. know so I I know um back to the stress like we're so good at it 
That's the problem. I have to convince people like, no, you are stressed. I don't feel stressed. I'm like, that's famous last words. Like, <laughs> you know, just because you don't feel stressed doesn't mean your body's not like under an intense amount of pressure. Yes. Okay. Um, so if somebody wanted to reach you, how would they get a hold of you? Speakwithjared.com. Oh, so, that's so easy. Yep. Speak yep. with J A R E D dot com. Yep. Yeah. Um, there's a little discovery call. Uh, people fill out a bubble for him. I say that's kind of a free gift. You get to actually see what parts of your brain are being affected the most. Cause mm. um right now most people don't even know that. Yes. Um but then just me kind of taking a pulse, like where are you at on your health journey? What are basically like how'd you get to today? What's going on? You know, um, like I don't expect anyone listening to this podcast, but I just say things like, I don't take ALS, you mm-hmm. know. Um I don't think, well, I don't want to say, I don't think any doctor should, like I have some ALS patients, but they have to basically twist my arm. Like, please help me. Cause I just let everybody know, like the fatality rate of ALS is still a hundred percent. Nobody's cracked that code. Mm. And I never want to give anyone false hope. So like, you know, I've had some women get off. um, It's sad story, but you know, they get off the ventilator and I'm like, that's good. You know, you don't have to have this stupid machine next to you all the time, but you know, as, um, I'm a realist at the end of the day, you know, so I never want mm-hmm. to give any, like, like I just use cancer doctors. So like, you have four months to live. I'm like, how the heck do you know that? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, do you have a crystal ball? Like, give me these lottery numbers, dude. <laughs> but, 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 you know, but I'm like, man, they just put their limited thinking and they projected that on them. Yeah. So I'll never do that. But I'll just, just say like, Hey, I'm not saying like somebody can't cure your ALS but I don't think I'm the guy to do that. Right. You know, like I just shoot straight with people. Cause I've had that false hope. My wife was my first patient. So I know what it feels like to be on that roller coaster. This is going to work. There's a doctor that's going to do it. And then they're not. So yeah. I know what that's. Yeah. And I would I never well. want to do that. To, I never want to do that to anybody. So. So yeah, if, if they're a good fit for you, you'll let them know. And if you're not, you'll also let them know. So yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a pleasure and I'm sure um, game changing for a lot of listeners around really rethinking how they think about their own anxiety. Absolutely. Thanks for having me.